First of all, thank you so much for joining today. So this paper, which is a joint work with my co-author Saurabh Paul, so in this paper we are trying to understand whether a dominant social group in a neighborhood can influence the learning outcome of the marginalized children or not. <clears throat> so let me start by giving you a brief uh, background of the Indian education system. So what has happened in the last few decades, India has undertaken a significant reforms in its education system with the introduction for Sarva Siksha Abhyan, which means education for all in 2009, 2001. And this was later reinforced with Right to Education Act in 2009. And one of the important objectives of these reforms has been to universalize the education and also to bridge the social and gender gaps particularly at the elementary school level. Now, as a result of these reforms, what has happened in the, last, in the last few years, in the last decades, India has achieved almost a universal enrollment uh, rate, particularly in primary schools. So more than 96% children are in the age group of 6 to 14 years are now in school. And now, as more and more children are now in school, what becomes interesting to understand is whether they are learning anything in school or not. Unfortunately, uh, learning assessment at both national and international level shows a very uh, grim picture. So large number of students in India uh, who are enrolled in school, but they are not equipped with the basic uh, reading and writing skills. So for example, this is in 2018, annual state test of education report find that only half of the children who are enrolled in grade five can actually read the text which is meant for the grade two. So the student reached the grade five, but they still can't read. So 50% of them still can't read the text which is meant for the grade two. Similarly, only one third of can do a very basic skill, which is the division. So they are in grade five, but the one third of them can only do division. So two third of them then can still can't do the division. So this is from the India. And even at the international level, India took part in program for international student assessment, where India ranked 72 uh, out of 73 countries in 2009. So clearly, children are going to school. But when it comes to learning, there is an inadequate learning. So this in itself is a big challenge, that low learning level. But what I'm going to talk about is not only these learning outcomes are low, but there is a huge intergroup disparities in these learning outcomes. And the group that I'm talking about is a social group. So some of you might be aware that uh, so in India, based on, so India has the caste system, the traditional caste system, where some people are placed, by the birth, they are placed, uh, so there is a um, social hierarchical system, where some groups, some part of the population are placed at the top of this hierarchy, some are at the bottom by birth, and some are the outcasted, like they are not the part of these hierarchies. And the two groups, which are not the part of this entire hierarchy, they are considered as the two most disadvantaged socioeconomic groups in India. And these groups groups have been subjected to centuries of exclusion and discrimination. And in our constitution, so they have been referred to as scheduled caste, the SCs and the STs. So they are the two most marginalized group in India. Then they constitute roughly 25% of the India's population. Now in efforts to uplift these two marginalized groups, government of India has provided them with several affirmative actions so that they can come up with the rest of the population. However, despite these efforts, these groups still remain overrepresented among the illiterate, low level of occupation, consumption, and wages. And coming back to the learning level, so what I'm trying to show you in this graph, so we have five learning skills. So there are students who cannot read at all. So these are for the children who are in the age group of 8 to 11 years, and so they cannot read at all. So the blue, blue, uh, Mark depicts that proportion of students who cannot read at all, and the highest score is the kids who can read a complete story. And we have three groups, the SC, the STs, the two marginalized group, and the rest of the population, which is non-SCST. So what we see here is that the larger proportion of students from the non-SCST background can read a story, which means they, can, they are on the higher uh, 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 learning skills, whereas the, higher, the, the SC and STs are overrepresented at the lower level of learning. So 20% of the students from the scheduled caste, they cannot read at all. They are in the age group of 8 to 11 years, still they can't read at all. Similarly, the numbers and proportion is 19% from the student who is belonging to the ST. So this is for the reading skills. If you look at the arithmetic skills, once again, we find that the SC and STs are overrepresented at the lower levels of learning. So the proportion of students who cannot recognize numbers are higher from SC and SC background compared to the non-SC history. 
Now, why do we think that it's a problem, that some groups are doing good, some groups are... Why, why do we need to address this? Well, if we want to achieve the goal of inclusive education, we have to pay attention that uh, nobody should lag behind. Not only that, the education, we all know that education is associated with the social and economic mobility, right? And the deficit that you see at a very early on, at the school age, they just magnifies over time. So if we don't pay attention at the right time and pay attention at the later stage, it just widen up, right? So we have to pay attention to these inequalities that we see at the right age, when the children started going to school. Uh, okay. Now, what the literature suggests? So if you look at the literature, literature has mostly directed attention to two sorts of factors. So why the children from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes perform uh, are lagging behind compared to the non-SCST is, so one could be the individual or the household factors. So most of them are coming from the parents are the first generation learners, so they don't get any help. The parents are poor, they cannot send them to the, uh, let's say, private tuitions, or they cannot send them to the good schools, or uh, they're not getting any help from the school. So one set of factors, the one set of literature has directed attention to these kind of individual and the household related factors. The others are the school factors, like the type of the school that they are going to, the public versus private, or the teachers discriminatory beh uh, behavior towards these uh, groups in the school can explain that why they are lacking behind compared to the other population. So while we believe that certainly these are the important factors uh, to understand these gap, but still we feel that this gives a very limited explanation. And in this paper, we are trying to argue that it's the village social structure that also plays a very important role in understanding the low learning levels of these two marginalized groups. So by the village social structure, I mean, so assume that we have a neighborhood. Now, which group is a dominant in our neighborhood? Can that determine the learning outcomes of these marginalized kids? And with this, we are making the contribution to the literature that we are, we are trying to look at this new factor, which is a village social structure. And also, we are trying to move away uh, to this emerging literature, which is, so usually the, the social identity is associated with the individual or the household, right? But in this paper, we are trying to look when the identity is associated with a ge larger geographical unit, like a village, and its impact on the economic outcome, which in our case is a learning outcome. Now, well, how do we think the village dominance plays any important, can influence the learning outcome? So, neighborhood and community plays a very important role in the social and economic mobility for the later life. So, there is a literature in USA and Europe which suggests that neighborhood that the child lives in when they were young plays a very important role in their later life outcomes. So, think of a situation. There is a kid from a marginalized caste. So in the first case, assume that he's staying in a village which is dominated by the higher caste, the other caste group. So in, in such setting, the caste of the marginalized kid is very salient, right? Because the, the, they, they are in minority and the group, the higher caste is the dominant group. So they may experience a higher stress, differential treatment in such setting, which lower their confidence and thereby they perform lower. Then their learning outcome is low. Now in the other situation, the higher caste, so there is a literature which suggests that the higher caste dominated, the non scst dominated villages are also the privileged villages in terms of getting the good quality of public school. So when the marginalized kids are staying in these villages, it also means that they have access to the good quality public schools, which can influence their learning outcome positively, right? So in the first case, it could affect their learning outcome negatively. In the second case, it could affect their outcome negatively. Now which of these effects is dominant is something that we try to imperative seek in this paper. Okay, so how do we define the village dominance? So this concept of village dominance is, is not new. In fact, it is borrowed from anthropology and sociology literature, where the village dominance is defined as a group based on the economic power. So the group holding the maximum economic power in a village or in a neighborhood is said to be the dominant social group. Uh, now, in recently, this dominant caste or uh, is, is in the empirical literature, how is it defined is based only on the economic power. So based on the land ownership. So uh, let me tell you what defined we use. So we, we use a caste dominant. So basically this, which group is dominant based on the economic power, which is arising from the land ownership. So for example, if the SC owns the majority of the total village land. So in the village, there is a, let's say the, uh, there is a hundred percent land. Now the 80% of the land is owned by the SC. We say that the group, the, the SC is a dominant group. If 70, so whoever, which, whichever groups owns the majority of the land in total village, they have the maximum economic power and that group is said to be the uh, dominant group. 
We used a very, uh, recent round of Indian Human Development Survey, which was in 2009, 2011, and it's a nationally represented survey of 42,000 households in 1,500 villages. And a separate schedule for reading, writing, and arithmetic skills is also uh, canvassed in this schedule, which helps us to determine the learning outcome of these kids. Okay, so our main um, so our main assumption here is that this village dominance variable, which is our main variable of interest, is exogenous. Now, why do we think it's exogenous? Is that so? Historically, it was only the the people of the upper caste or the higher caste who owns the most of the economic resources, and they were the dominant caste, right? In 1950s, what happened is that. Uh, mm, they were the they were the landlords and the people from the lower caste were working on their land with the in 1950s, there was something called abolition of Jamidari system, where the land was given from these higher caste landlords to the people who are working, which is mostly from the lower caste. So the economic power kind of redistributed from the higher caste also to the lower caste. And that's how the, even the lower caste also became dominant in some of the villages. And that's the variation that we try to exploit in this, in this paper. And after 1950s, there is nothing major in terms of the land reform system that could redistribute this land. So village caste composition and land settlement patterns have been, remained essentially unchanged uh, after 1950s. So if you look at these two years, 2005 and 2011, we see that the village which are dominated by different group is fairly constant. So the proportion of village which are dominated by SC, ST, and non-SC, ST is, is fairly constant. So the, the, the assumption that the SC, ST is exogenous is kind of uh, proved there. The other concern that it could be that people will migrate to the villages with a better economic outcome is also less likely in our uh, sample because more than 95% of the sample in our village has been staying for more than 50 years in their village of uh, residence. If you also look at the change in the land ownership uh, between 2005 and 11, again, it's, it's, it's close to zero. So there is no significant change in uh, land. Also, the sale and purchase of land in, in, in rural India is quite low. Okay, so coming back to the uh, to the main, now I'll just talk about my results. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to test this very simple hypothesis that you and me, uh, we belong, so you and me, we both are from the marginalized caste. You are staying in a village which is dominated by your same caste group. I'm staying in a village which is dominated by the higher caste group. All other things are same. We have same socioeconomic status. We are going to same type of school. Do we see any difference in our learning outcome just because our neighborhoods are different? That is what we are go uh, going to uh, test uh, now. Okay. So the first thing is the identity. These are the kids. So SC is this, uh, the social identity of a kid. And this is the identity of a village. So what we are trying, we have two learning outcomes. The one is cannot read at all. And the other is can read a story. Uh, the lowest and the highest outcome. So what we see here is that if you look the how the SC kid in the non-SC ST village is performing, the SC kid in the SC dominated village is performing, and the SC kid in ST dominated village is performing. This is what we are going to see. Okay. So if we look at the proportion of the kids who cannot read at all, so the proportion of SC kids who cannot read at all is higher in a non-SC ST dominated villages. So when the neighborhood of the SC kid is dominated by the higher caste group, they are less likely to, uh, they are more likely that they cannot read at all. And the, uh, if you look at those who cannot, who can read the story, which is like uh, getting the highest score on learning, we find that the SCs, the higher proportion of the SCs in their own caste dominance, so 37% of the SCs can read a story when they stay in the village, which is dominated by their same caste compared to the higher caste group. This is for the reading skills, and this is also true for the arithmetic. Once again, we see that the proportion of the students who cannot recognize number the SC kids are lower when they stay in their own caste dominated villages compared to the non SCST dominated villages. Uh, and, and they do similar in division. So for SC, the, the clear pattern is that they are doing better in their own uh, caste dominated villages compared to the higher caste dominated villages. For STs, we do not find a very clear pattern. Uh, and one of the reasons could be that 
so the STs are still uh, so more than 70 percent of the STs. These are basically the tribal population. They stay in the village, which are dominated by their caste, uh, their same caste. So their integration into the other caste is still very low. So I mean, we are not able to exploit that variation in the dominant caste, and that that is that could be one reason that for STs we do not see a very uh, clear pattern. So these are the main findings of the paper, that for the scheduled caste students, we find that they are doing better in their own caste-dominated villages in both reading and arithmetic skills. Next, we just try to see whether these results are uh, robust or not. So while we believe that our village dominance variable is exogenous, there could be several other confounding factors which may influence our outcome. So what we, run, what we do is that we run a very simple ordered profit model because our outcome variable is uh, in the ordered model, and our what is the ordered variable, and, and we just run this model and see that once we control for the parents' education, socioeconomic status, the type of the school that pay, uh, the children are going to, whether our results hold true or not. Uh, we find that our results does hold true. Uh, for SCs, we find that the, the, own, the own village advantage remains significant, even when we control for uh, the bunch of uh, important variables. For STs, we do not find any significant uh, results. This is true for both reading and arithmetic skills. Okay, so this was the first part of the paper where we show, show that the, the, the SCs are doing better in their own group. Now the question is why do we think that the SCs are doing better in their own caste dominated villages compared to the non SCST dominated villages? And here we try to highlight the role of the teacher's behavior. So we try to check whether the teacher's behavior towards the SC children differ in different types of villages. So we all know that teachers are believed to be the fundal, fundamental agents who influence the learning process in schools. Now in India, the practice of verbal abuse and the corporal punishment is legally prohibited. So teachers are not supposed to do it. It's legally uh, prohibited. But still, in 2011, more than 40% of the parents reported that their kid has been beaten up in the last 30 days or has been scolded up by the teachers in the last 30 days. So despite the legal prohibition, the one of the most common way to ensure discipline in school is, is the corporal and the verbal abuse. Mm, so what we do is that we try to measure the teacher's behavior through these three indicators. So whether the child has been beaten up in the last 30 days, whether the child has been scolded in the last 30 days, and whether the child felt that the class teachers has treated him or her unfairly. And this is the teacher's behavior towards the SC kid in the non-SCST dominated villages and SC dominated villages. So remember that SCs were doing better in their own caste dominated villages. So what we are trying to show here is that the teacher, the student are more likely to be beaten up, the SC children are more likely to be beaten up, scolded and treated unfairly when they stay in the village which are dominated by the higher caste compared to their own caste dominated villages. So this could be one channel that teaches behavior towards the SC children vary across different villages which may explain that why they are performing higher in their own caste dominated villages compared to their own uh, <coughs> compared to their own caste dominated villages. Okay, now why do we think the teachers misbehave with SC children in the higher caste dominated uh, villages? Now one could be there is, there is now this literature which shows that teachers sharing the same characteristics with the students are able to understand the student needs better, right? Because they can understand the struggle that they are going to. Now in the non scsc dominated villages, the, the proportion of the teachers which are coming from the higher caste is higher. So there is a higher social distance between the SCs and the non scsds because the teacher's caste is different, the student caste is different, and they may not be able to understand the vulnerability of the student, the marginalization of student that they are coming, right? The other thing could be that the teachers exert more influence and power in the non scst dominated villages. So the teachers know that the SC is a minority caste in this village. So they know that even if I behave, misbehave with them, they don't have power or voice and nothing will rebound on them. Nobody will complain about, about me because they are the minority caste, right? But whereas in the SC dominated villages, the teachers know that the, this village has been dominated by the SCs. So they have, they hold the power. So if I misbehave with them, it will rebound on me. People will get collect, the people will uh, file complaint against me or people will take action against me because they are the dominant cause. They have that power. So that these, these are the reason that we think that why the teachers uh, could be, that the, that the teachers misbehave with SC children in the villages when, which are dominated by the uh, non-SCSTs. 
Uh, we also try to explore the several other possible. So while the teacher's behavior is a one channel, we also try to look for the other alternative channel. So think of a situation, it could be possible that it's not the teacher's behavior, but let's say the quality of the school in the SC dominated school, uh, in the SC dominated villages is better. Or let's, uh, let's say that it's the overall discrimination in the SC dominated villages is low compared to the non SCST dominated villages. So that improves the uh, confidence of the children. And that's why they perform better and so it's not the teachers behavior but the overall discrimination in the village from the people from the neighborhood that could explain we do not it could be that the parents of the children aspiration in the different villages could be different so the SC parents may have a higher aspiration in their own dominated villages which could influence their learning uh, positively compared to the non scsc dominated but we do not find any of these alternative uh, channels to hold true which kind of make our uh, the the channel of teachers behavior even more uh, yeah important so these are the main main findings of the paper we find significant intercaste differences in both reading and writing uh, in both reading and arithmetic skill we find that the sc children they score higher when they stay in the village which are dominated by their same caste group and one of the important channel that we find is the probability of beaten up scolded and treatment unfair and treated unfairly is lower when the children the sc children stay in their own caste dominated villages compared to the higher caste dominated villages we also did certain robustness check so we use alternative definitions of village dominance so so far we define base village dominance based on the economic power but we also use the population so which group is numerically strong we also define our village dominance based on that we also combine the population and the land share so basically both the numerical power and the economic power and created a new measure of village dominance and uh, yeah and we find that our results hold true instead of reading and arithmetic we use the writing as a learning outcome and we find the uh, the similar results thank you thank you